Welcome back to Ox Tools, I'm Tom. So we got another batch of meatloaf here. So I'm back on the meatloaf train. Uh, I'm sure that makes a lot of folks happy out there. Um, I actually never, you know, I guess I had some idea that people will enjoy the meatloaf. And, uh, um, but the number of uh, positive comments that have come through are kind of humbling. And uh, so uh, I'll be back on the meatloaf train. It's fun for me too, so uh, there's all kinds of interesting things to look at and just take a quick peek at. And uh, that's kind of what we do in the meatloaf episodes for uh, new folks that are not used to the, or not familiar with the series. So true to form, I got a list of stuff that we're gonna go through, just kind of general shop stuff, a little bit of shop work, uh, some interesting phenomena, uh, books, tools, all kinds of stuff. So let's check it out. Right. So this one is, um, this is an old book that, uh, that I picked up from, a, um, actually a, a friend uh, sent me a whole box of, uh, of old textbooks and whatnot. And this is called uh, Finishing Metal Products. And let's see, the date is uh, 1935, McGraw-Hill. And I found a really interesting picture in here. So I want to, I want to set the stage. So um, all, most of you guys out there are familiar with a YouTuber. Uh, and I'm not going to mention any names, that does some uh, flame spray, um, you know, surface buildup and shaft repair, stuff like that. So that's how I'm going to set the stage. And I'm going to show you a picture in this book. And uh, I want you to keep that thought in your mind while you're <laughs> viewing this picture and then uh, tell me what you think, okay? So what do you think of that? So there's a guy doing some flame spraying and spray coating. Um, but in particular, look at the gentleman here. So uh, just saying. <laughs> anyway, I thought I got a kick out of that. Uh, this book is, uh, it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, there's a few little things in here, but that was like the main thing that, uh, that I wanted to show was, uh, was uh, uh, this dude here uh, doing some uh, spray coating, so, okay. So while we're on the subject of books, um, a, uh, a viewer that uh, generally prefers to stay anonymous um, um, bought some stuff off eBay, but he uh, actually directed it uh, over to me uh, for uh, review, I guess uh, we'd call it. Anyway, uh, there's a kind of a collection of booklets here that, um, that came from somebody that used to work uh, on submarines, uh, which is kind of interesting. So. These are from, um, I think it was General Dynamics, is that right? Yeah, General Dynamics. So these were probably little handout books uh, for designers and, uh, and ship fitters and, and whatnot. We're not going to go through them all. I've got a few things flagged here. Let's set those aside. Um, these are uh, velocities uh, of um, acoustic impedance and um, velocities. Uh, sound and different materials, things like that. Um, reference angles, this one's kind of neat here. It's a little uh, pre-weld uh, uh, kind of checklist, which is kind of neat, uh, all riveted together and laminated. Um, yeah, prior to welding, general dynamics, pretty cool, right? And um, let's see, what was this one? Memory jogger, yeah, I forgot about this one. <laughs> um, this one's, uh, you know, I don't know, there's all kinds of management systems and, uh, and methodologies and whatnot, and you can kind of go crazy uh, uh, looking at all this stuff. But I flip through it, and sometimes I pick up something that, that I can apply to the, the work that I do. So, uh, uh, Wilder's Vest Pocket Guide, you know, just some general information. Um, this one, let's see, is this one, uh, what was the... Uh, Oh, no, it is one of these actually. Let's get, let's get rid of those. So, so this is uh, this is cool. Conversion factors for the reactor designer, which is like pretty cool right out of the gate, right? And I think that's all I wanted to show on that one. These are just uh, uh, conversion factors um, that uh, to go between different units and whatnot. Most of our phones do this. Most most all of these uh, already anyway. But the the cover of this one's pretty neat because it shows some tube sheets and things that you might see inside reactors, right? Okay. So the, the most interesting one is this this guy here. Um, 
and the cover is a little stiff, so we're going to do that. I kind of like this logo here. Uh, it's uh, the dude with the uh, the reactor in his head, and he's shooting torpedoes out, or what? I, you know what? I, I don't even know what they're doing there. So, uh, but it's kind of funny. In uh, 1964, I was three years old, so uh, it's pretty old here. Let's just look at the uh, the ones I have flagged because we, you know. We can spend a lot of time on these if we're not careful here. All right, what's, what did I, what did I, oh, okay, this is, uh, so uh, not a lot, uh, some folks will be familiar with this uh, HY-80 steel here, and this is a steel that they use for submarine and ship hulls and things like that. It's a high strength steel. Um, it's got a minimum yield, I think, of uh, 80,000 PSI. Uh, so it's pretty strong stuff. And I'm going to pop up a picture here of um, uh, a set of plate rolls that uh, I toured a, 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 um, a ship fitting um, uh, heavy plate fabrication shop. And uh, we're going to take a look at that picture. And you can see in that picture <laughs> that that thing has a massive capacity, right? The, those rolls. And, uh, but they specifically um, note uh, HY80 steel uh, or whatever it was, HY something in that. It might have been 100 too. Um, you know, the capacity in that is significantly reduced. So anyway, it's just kind of an interesting data point. Um, that uh, that I can that I tie back together to a pretty cool looking machine, okay. And then this is neat here. They have the uh, kind of the layout of the uh, the planes when they're talking about planes and axes uh, for doing the layout. And of course, they had a picture of a submarine, which is really cool, right? And uh, uh, which I thought was kind of neat. So, and then this is uh, they. In these big fab shops, they have these uh, floor, uh, floor plates that are full of holes, and they actually do bending and layout and whatnot on those uh, on those plates. They're gigantic, and I've seen some of these, and they're 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 pretty cool. It'd be really nice to uh, have a shop set up that way. And oh yeah, you know what? Okay, so you guys take a look at this thing. So this, I look I, I looked at this for five minutes and went. What, who's the moron that, that drew this chart up, right? Okay, so I understand what they're doing, right? So they're telling you a measurement at a particular distance for one degree, two degree, three degrees, et cetera, et cetera, right? But here's the thing that screwed me up. Degree chart at two inches that, uh, hyphen foot. So what, what the hell is that, right? So right out of the gate, it screws you up, right? So what it is, is it's degree chart at two feet, not foot, two feet, right? Get rid of the tick marks there, right? So at two feet, one degree is 1332 inches or 0.406 or a little over 10 millimeters for our metric folks, right? And then to further confuse you, so read this sentence. So why couldn't you type this all in one line? A half degree equals one and five eighths at, I'm going to figure out, at eight foot, it, it's, just, it's just a moron, okay? So whoever typed this up didn't do a very good job, and I was pretty annoyed. But it's kind of a handy chart, um, and, you know, you guys can compile this in, uh, in Excel, and it's kind of handy to have some of these in your mind, at least the one degree one, right? Because you can extrapolate, okay? Um, you can double, triple, quadruple, et cetera, et cetera, or multiply by 10, and you'll actually be pretty close, okay? So it's kind of a handy thing. The one I remember is the sine of one degree is 0 0.0175, right? So 17 and a half thousandths at one inch. So from that, you can extrapolate um, angles, um, you know, estimate angles just by looking at them and taking a couple quick measurements. So it's kind of handy, but this chart sucks. So anyway, that's the books. And um, so secret viewer, thanks for sending these. And uh, I'll, uh, these may end up with Keith Rucker for um, uh, scanning to put on the, uh, 
uh, vintage machinery uh, org site. So this next one is um, actually for the uh, our our friend that sent the uh, the booklets that typically uh, prefers to remain uh, anonymous. But this is a cool little um, um, cool little hammer. Obviously, it's a hammer. Um, but this was made by a friend of mine that passed away recently, and you can you can just see her name kind of uh, um, peeking through there. And you know, I saw this in her shop, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, and I kind of liked it, you know, partly because of the patina, the handle, and it was clearly a shop-made hammer, right? But it just had some kind of nice lines to it. Okay, um, this one's made out of brass. It's about an 25 millimeters in diameter around an inch and uh, you know it's uh, two and a half inches long so I decided that this you know my personal belief is brass makes a shitty hammer or excuse my French there brass, brass makes kind of a crappy hammer I, I much prefer copper brass is actually quite a bit harder than copper and it'll mark stainless steel even if you're not careful and uh, you know I mean it's okay right uh, for a soft hammer soft-ish hammer but it's not particularly soft so I remade this uh, I kind of copied the design just kind of in honor of, of Carla there and uh, and I made it in in copper okay and um, anyway it's basically kind of the same and uh, it's a McMaster car handle and uh, you know um, the hardest part was cutting that that oval opening there um, for for that, and then I marked it with the year that I uh, that I made it there. Now I changed it, I tweaked it just slightly. Um, I thinned up these these faces just a whisker, and um, the other thing I did was I this diameter here is I reduced it so it was smaller than these. So when it lays on the bench, which is most of its life. Uh, and you're sliding around. You're not. You're, you're not grinding the sides of the uh, of the hammer off, right? Okay. So I just did that. And then here's a uh, here's a a slightly different one. Uh, this one actually is brass here. I was playing around with the brass too. But what's interesting is, or maybe interesting, is kind of how I did that. So let's pop over to the lathe. I'm not going to make one, uh, but I'm just going to show you the setup. And uh, and if you want a hammer like this, you can you can spin one up yourself. And this is a method that you can use to uh, uh, do some symmetrical features like that. So let's check it out. Right. So here's the uh, here's the setup here. You see, I have two tool bits and a large uh, tool block here, and these actually form the uh, these pockets here or these cutouts here, kind of in one plunge. Okay. Uh, so that's the general idea. We're going to go ahead and do one on this piece of PVC here, just for uh, just for fun. And I have a little recipe of all the positions and whatnot of uh, and the depths of the tool, etc. Okay, that's zeroed already. I'm going to come over at one point. Not like that. Okay. So this is just going to be a you know quick and dirty here. So the other thing, uh, in fact, I'm just trying this actually is uh, supporting this end uh, with a little a little cap. Let's see, let's do this. And I got to use a, a real small live center to get up in there. Um, let's see how that looks. Okay. Looks pretty good. We got some pressure on there to help support that. Actually, I'm gonna increase that a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, you guys can see that okay. All right, contact. Sure, why not? All right, so I go up until I touch, like so. And you see both tools touched here, bank, bank, right? So it takes a little while to uh, to get that set, I guess. All right. And the recipe calls for 300 thousandths on the diameter. Let's just go ahead. 200. So, all right, 
so you can actually do it pretty pretty quick and then after this then I would uh, yeah, come on you bugger yeah, like so uh, I would come back and uh, uh, turn the center down a little bit and then uh, um, these get turned down below the bar stock sizes so they clean up and then I come back and uh, do a corner radii on there on each side and uh, and then a chamfer and off you go so over to the mill so anyway that's uh, one way you can do multiple forms real quickly like that and uh, uh, with a manual lathe so righto here's uh, so this is the last look at these hammers here so brass copper brass and then this is the PVC one we just did over with the tool. I went ahead and finished it with the the, uh, the radius tool and then turned it and parted it off. So maybe I'll put a handle on that one too. PVC hammer? I don't know. So this is the, these are the hammer ha handles. I, I just buy these from McMaster Car. They're a couple bucks and um, they have that kind of oval head. I think it's a uh, ball peen uh, or machinist hammer handle. Um, Okay, all right, so that was for our, our friend, uh, our mystery friend, and, um, and uh, there it is. This next one um, has to do with uh, removing um, tarnish and oxide from copper. So I got a couple of victims here, and a couple different ways you can do that, okay? Um, so I have two different solutions, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna try both of them and put them in for the same amount of time. One is, um, I was talking to the guy at the plating shop the other day and uh, he mentioned that the, the copper bright dip is basically uh, phosphoric acid. Um, he, didn't, he didn't say what concentration it was or any particulars about it, but uh, um, so I, I started looking around for kind of Johnny homeowner flavor of uh, phosphoric acid, right? Well, most of these products, they don't list them that way. But what I did find was this stuff here, okay? This is concrete uh, and metal prep, um, and um, it is phosphoric acid, and I think it says so on the label. Um, just double checking here. I remember I stood at Home Depot for 15 minutes reading all the labels and whatnot, and um, um, okay, well, I'm not going to read the whole thing again. Um, reading all the labels, there was a bunch of different products that were on the, along these lines that were probably phosphoric acid, but this particular one was labeled as such. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to put a little in this cup here. Not much. Okay, just a little bit, and it's got a kind of a green color to it there. Cover that up. And then this other, um, this other stuff here. This is uh, this is homebrew here. And what this is is um, uh, white vinegar and salt mixed together. So, you know, that volume of uh, of white vinegar and probably uh, three or four tablespoons of um, um, of just plain iodized salt. Okay, and then dissolved. All right. So we'll put the same amount in there. Just visually, okay, close enough. All right, and then we got some pennies here that are, these are copper pennies, they don't have, um, these are pre-82 or whatever it is, uh, and they don't have uh, zinc in them. So we're just gonna, well, you know, a couple of seconds is not really gonna make any difference here, so let's just do that. And uh, we'll give it about 10 minutes and, um, Let's see, I don't want them touching here. Let's, and, uh, I'm going to use a different tool here. I don't want to contaminate. Okay. All right, so they're, none of them are touching. And um, we'll leave those for about 10 minutes and uh, come back. And then we'll pop them out and, uh, and see what, uh, what it looks like. Okay. Anyway, this is, if you work with copper and um, um, you've probably experienced fingerprints and um, uh, sulfurized cutting oil uh, staining the material and uh, being a general pain in the neck, so uh, um, this is one way you can clean it. Okay, <laughs> 26 minutes, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
I got uh, I got sidetracked on something. All right, pull these out. That one doesn't look so good there. I wonder if that's a. I'm gonna examine that one. Maybe that one's a uh, a zinker. I don't know. We'll have to see. Those look pretty good. These are hard to tell because the stuff's green. Oh yeah, that looks like that works pretty good too. Alright, All right, so I don't think we need that anymore. What did you say, 20, 26 minutes or... Yeah, those look pretty nice. Now what's going on with this one here? Maybe a uh, maybe a zinc one uh, slipped into the. Uh, it says 82 on it. I think that's the year it changed. So uh, I'm gonna call that an anomaly. I think because I think that's the year that it. One of you intrepid uh, Googlers can check that real quick. Pretty sure that that's the uh, the year that it changed. Okay, so. What's my what's my opinion here? My opinion is that these both work really well. These both work. Uh, you know what? I think the phosphoric works a little bit better if you if you put them. Okay, let's do this. Let's put them side by side. That'll help. Put our Uncle Abe there that's not looking too happy there. Yeah, I'm going to give a nod to the phosphoric there. Um, is a slightly, uh, produces a slightly better finish. Now you could probably twiddle the formula here. This is certainly easy to make up a small batch, okay? This is like probably for most of us a lifetime supply. This is several lifetime supplies. Um, and um, um, although, um, if you want a slightly better uh, uh, cleaning action there, <laughs> yeah, look at that. It's you know what it attacked that. I bet you that's got zinc in it. So uh, um, initially, I think this was working faster, but it's a little hard to tell because um, the color of this you can't you can't see into it. So it doesn't look like it's doing anything. Uh, this one though. It's clear, it's relatively clear, so you can see and it cleans it pretty rapidly. So cheap and easy, a uh, little bit better marginally. Is it worth it? Yeah, you'll have to decide for yourself. Um, I think this was 15 bucks or 12 bucks or something like that for this gallon jug of this, uh, you know, 3.8 liters of, uh, of juice there. Um, and, uh, you yeah, know, 128 ounces, right? Um, so you know, marginally better on that. So anyway, if you got copper to clean, or you maybe you make jewelry, or um, you have, uh, I mean, if you need to make, uh, um, if you have tarnished um, copper conductors and you need to clean them to make better connections, this is a good way to do that. And um, Bob's your uncle, so do what you will with that. This next one's pretty cool. So I'm showing you this uh, this Funko. Uh, this is the data plate, um, you know, speeds and feeds and whatnot uh, off on my yam lathe, my large yam lathe. Well, this lathe happens to be kind of a clone of a Morseiki, a Watchon, a Web, and um, I'm not sure what others uh, at this point. Um, so they all have uh, the same gear ratios, the same um, uh, feed gears, and the same speed ranges, right? Well, a friend of mine, Tom Utley, um, is kind of building up a business, building uh, data plates like this one and small ones like, like these here, these other ones, um, for restoration projects for machinery and uh, all kinds of stuff. So he's worked out how to uh, etch and enamel these and uh, do the artwork, and he's getting kind of a, a process going on that. Now, let me show you. He sent me this cool deal. So this is a replacement, and as you, you can see, oh, well, I didn't even notice it. 
it's longer than the um, I just laid it up here I didn't really look at it that closely so it's a whisker longer than the uh, the stalker here I don't think that's a problem I think I'm going to use the stock one and to poke the holes in this one I'll use it as a template because I don't want to drill additional holes but look at that it's beautiful so it's got the letters are raised the the fields around the uh, um, the, the what shows is depressed and then enameled and um, so I think we're going to pop this sucker loose or start working on it here um, okay that one came up pretty easy I don't want to lose these uh, these little drive rivets here um, I think I have some or you can get them let's just put it that way if not oh boy You know, he and I were joking uh, uh, a little bit, you know, that uh, I'm going to put, it's kind of like a, putting a, uh, a mink coat on a, on a, uh, on a pig <laughs> a little bit. Oh, I might need something a little thicker on that one. Let's get up. I don't want to. All right, these lower ones seem to be going pretty good. All right. Let's see here. That way, I can get up, there we get up flat to that one. Let's put that back on so I don't drop some ball bearings in there or something. Something stupid. All right. Let me, let me work on these uh, these upper ones a little bit, and uh, we'll come back and uh, see what we can do. These. Uh, Little drive screws are kind of tight, actually. Let's do that. Just gonna tap them out there. To recover them. So yeah, it, it wasn't hard to get them out. I just had to put a little more English on them. And uh, all right, there was the treasure. Did, okay, put those aside there. All right, so I'll straighten this a little bit, and then uh, we'll clamp it. We'll center it up and clamp it to the top, and and then mark. Uh, Mark the new holes on this. It's got a protective film on it, so I'll just mark right on that film. Let's uh, spend a little, a few minutes here uh, getting this relatively flat. So. And clean. I think, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm going to wash this. So here's the, the old data plate on top of the new data plate. And the first thing I notice is, look at this end here. Um, and it's the old data plate that's uh, not square. Um, and you never noticed it looking at the machine. Or maybe there's, an, well, this end looks pretty good too. Um, I don't know where that came from. So I'm gonna, you know, I could move the holes outboard a little bit, but I think I'm gonna go with the existing holes. I'm going to transfer punch them with a little itty bitty transfer punch. But what I want to do is I'm going to clamp the two pieces together first. Now, a viewer, um, actually an old, a long time viewer, uh, I call him Rusty. That's not his real name, and he's up in uh, he's up in Canada, and uh, he's a uh, uh, a regular commenter on the channel. And he was asking about can't twist clamps, and these are some of my favorite clamps. Um, not these two specifically, but the uh, favorite style of clamps. So you see machinists using these, uh, use them a lot on the surface grinder, a lot on the mill, and not so much on the lathe <laughs> for obvious reason. Um, one reason uh, that they're, they're nice is in the direction that they open and close, they're very, very low profile, okay? So uh, when doing setups on the mill, this gives you, uh, gives you 
additional room that uh, you might not have um, uh, otherwise. Um, so I'm going to use these two here, and I think I'm just going to clamp them on the on the sides here like this. So let me just I got this all centered up already, so I'm just going to scoot this over here. I might be off off out of frame. Okay, I got one on there, which is probably enough to stabilize it till I get the second one on. Okay. All right, so now those aren't going to move relative to one another. And now I, I need to, uh, what do I need? I need something to jack this end up here like that. Okay, so one problem with, uh, with transfer punches is that the point has some length to it. So when you're working with real thin materials, uh, a handy trick is to, is to put a little bit of space between the piece that you're, um, that you're got you're using to guide and uh, the uh, the target material here. So let me make sure I'm not over a damn hole there. All right, so I'm just going to give this a little little love tap there. Okay, got a nice uh, little dingus McGee. Rinse and repeat. Okay, nice dingus McGee. Okay, go there. Let's just put this under. Get it close, like so. Yes. I'm on the. Oops, that's not gonna work there, Mr. Wizard. Okay, let's go there. Yes. You know, there's a lot of people. Uh, they say, "Gee, Tom, you use that scale." for everything but measuring. And <laughs> I have to say that it's, they're right. It just is so handy for so many different things that I don't know what I would, what I would do without it. Okay. I'm just I'm trying to look through to make sure that I'm not on any numbers or or uh, letters or anything. I am in the in the fields a little bit. Okay, I got them all. Yes, I got them all. All right, we're going to show some more uh, cant twists here in a minute because uh, Rusty wanted to see the my clamp rack and uh, how I use some of those material. How I use some of those. All right, so we'll come back and we're going to punch those uh, punch those out. You know, it's just one less thing you gotta hold, you know, because you gotta you gotta fish it into the uh, you gotta fish it into the uh, center punch mark. Crank that up just a little. You gotta feel it in there. So you got a lot of things you're trying to do at the same time. Punches this brass really nice. All right, a couple more, and then uh, we'll go uh, pop this on. All right, well, I can see hole. All right, let's. Uh, do this gingerly. Get a few of them in there first to get things lined up. Come on, little buddy. Okay. So far, so good. Trying not to send one of these things flying here. There we go. You know, it squirts out of your hand, lands in the chip pan, which reminds me of a story. <laughs> I was running a CNC lathe one time, 
a long time ago, in the Kuma, and uh, I broke an insert, or chipped an insert, or it was time to change an insert, I don't remember which, it's all lost in the wash, but the, uh, oh yeah, that looks pretty good. The, uh, I dropped the stupid uh, screw out of the, uh, the tool holder in the chip pan. And I said, oh, okay, whatever. And uh, I went to, uh, I said, I'll just grab another one, right? So I went in the drawer where we, keep, we kept them, and uh, guess what? Didn't have any more of that particular screw. It was kind of an oddball, it was an oddball insert screw. And uh, I was in the middle of a job that was due, and, uh, and uh, I had no screw. I had no screw that I could modify. It was one of those things. Now I left, I left the plastic cover on here because I can peel it up and uh, I think I'm going to leave it on there because this thing's so gorgeous. I can already see it about a thousand times better than, uh, than uh, the old one. God, it makes my lathe look really crappy. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I cleaned out the whole chip pan I spent two hours or plus and I finally found that screw. Um, the chip conveyor was running, I immediately stopped that, dug and dug and dug and then finally I found this thing. I emptied the whole thing out, I cleaned it, and I finally found this damn screw and I was able to continue the job. It was, it stands out in my memory, let's just put it that way. All right, Tom, this is beautiful. Um, it looks great. Uh, my only comments are it's uh, slightly different than the yam plate as far as length. I don't know if that's just an anomaly um, with the the yam plate or there's a small variation with that in the Morsikis. Uh, but this looks fine. The installation looks good. Sure, I would have liked to have the uh, the rivets in the in those targets, but um, you know it's kind of 50-50. Either drill this or do that. So um, um, I'm still happy with it. So thank you very much for sending that. And uh, there's a link in the description to Tom's company if you want custom labels like this made with uh, anything you want on them. So talk to Tom and uh, it's uh, Vaughn Industrial and uh, check them out. All right, Rusty, this one's for you. So this is a, a selection of my, uh, my can't twist clamps and then there's some more over here. Uh, I'll show you those in just a sec. Those are just clamped on the edge of the toolbox. It's some repeats of this and then the very smallest ones. So. These are ones I just use all the time here, and uh, out of all of these particular ones here, uh, these are the ones I use the most. Now, um, can't twist. What you know? These are these kind of toggle clamps, or um, I don't, you know, I don't even know what the uh, what the right. Uh, they're actually variable force, okay? The force changes depending on the uh, where this is in the, in the pivot, okay? Uh, these are the two and a half D size here, so this is, that means deep throat this way. And um, these are, they're very small, they're light, um, and generally you're using them in this direction uh, on the mill, uh, although you can use them this way too. And as I mentioned earlier, you don't have this big, uh, like a C-clamp, you have this big screw sticking up or sticking down and getting in your way. So that's what makes Cant Twist really nice. They, uh, uh, contrary to their name, things do twist in them. So uh, one is none, two is one. Uh, just remember that. So when you're clamping things, if you got one clamp on something, it's better. It's almost like having no clamps. Uh, two is uh, 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 is the minimum typically that you want on, on something, and three is even better. Uh, so one is none, two is one. Uh, these are a little bit bigger, a little beefier, a little heavier. Uh, handles are a little a uh, little longer. Um, like I said, these I probably use these the most, and then after that, yeah, probably these guys would be my guess. Um, these are some little parallel clamps that just have uh, some knobs on them. Uh, I think I just picked these up at a at a garage sale or something like that. They were they were cool, so I stuck them in my rack. I haven't used them yet. Um, the little ones, the little ones are kind of handy uh, for small things like the, that plate that we were just looking at. This isn't the smallest version, so this is the kind of the in between. I think this is one inch capacity, 
and then that's the itty bitty one that's three quarter capacity. So one inch, three quarter. It's got a thumb knob as opposed to a T handle. And uh, what is, what's going on there? I wonder if they got wet. Huh. Something might have drooled out of the window up above. Okay, so these are just like super handy around the shop. They're pretty cheap, so you know, you buy them a couple at a time, and pretty soon you got a pretty good arsenal of them. And you know, whenever I see them at estate sales or garage sales or flea markets, I just pick them up because you can't go wrong. Uh, and a lot of times you end up using a lot of them, right? Um, anyway, and let's see, maybe we'll go look at the other clamp rack real quick because I think I got a couple of big ones back there, but I can't remember. I don't use them very much, and I, but I do think I have a couple of big ones. So, Just a quick note about the rack, uh, I forgot to mention it. Um, this is just a laser cut sheet metal rack from uh, Rockler Woodworking, okay? They sell them on their website, uh, they're for holding bar clamps. But uh, they work really good for, for this kind of stuff where, you, you know, you can make your own, uh, obviously. Um, but I think these are 12 or 15 bucks, something like that. And I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, if I'm standing there looking at it uh, and I go, oh, I'll just go home and make that, right? <laughs> You're better off just buying the damn thing and, uh, and supporting your local uh, uh, brick and mortar place and, uh, you know, saving your time for, uh, you know, the, those projects. Really want to work on it. Let me go pick that. This is the other clamp rack, um, and I do have some uh, some more can twists over here. This is one that uh, Saunders Machine Works sent me. Uh, they were doing a little project, and they made a bunch of these uh, uh, kind of giveaway gifts. And uh, so uh, it sits in the sits in the clamp rack over here. So here's a bigger one. This is a four and a half D. So uh, deep throat once again, and. Um, that. that is, I can't even read the marking on that one. There's a bigger one there. That is a six inch, they call that. And then another six. So I kind of have them in pairs. That's a, that would be a typical Tom, um, is to have uh, those in pairs. Okay. So when you, when you look at these, right, your clamping thing here, so if you're clamping something that thin, right, um, all this junk is sticking up and getting in your way, in particular on the mill and the surface grinder. So that's why uh, um, that's why these are lower profile here. So that for that same gap there, okay, you only have that much sticking up. So that's the big advantage on these things here is low profile, low profile and out of your way. Okay. Oh, well. That hose that you heard pop off a minute ago was uh, um, the next thing that I wanted to show you, and uh, it's uh, it's about air bearings. Okay, you guys have probably all heard about air bearings, and uh, so I got a little demo set up here that's kind of uh, kind of fun, and uh, I got a couple two different types of air bearing. Okay, two common types of air bearing, and one is on this uh, indicator stand here. All right, and I'll just show you what they look like. Um, this is a, what's called a uh, porous carbon style, okay? And then um, here's one that I made. Um, it's a little puck style here that uh, just has an orifice here, and we'll look at that a little closer in a minute. So um, um, let's play with it, because it's, it's, it's kind of a neat phenomenon. So that hose that popped off was actually this hose here, and it's just on a little barb, all right? So let's, uh, and this is just a filter unit uh, to keep the air clean that's going to the, going to these, all right. Um, and I think I have the pressure set, I think at the reg, at the main regulator is about 40, but then this is a regulator as well. So we're just going to open this up, all right, it's starting to lift off, and there it goes. And you can see this just gliding around. And it's kind of a, it's pretty, it's a pleasant feel. So if you're going to have an indicator stand uh, sliding around on a surface plate, this is how you'd want it to feel. Although you can see, uh, uh, you can see my uh, surface plate's not level <laughs> over here, right? <laughs> see, make sure. So you, you need to have it real clean. Now, so what's going on here is air is coming through here and it's being distributed to these three pucks. 
and it's working its way through this kind of porous carbon and this is sitting on a film of air and so I know a lot of you guys are out there going how thick's the film how thick's the film well we got an indicator on here and we're gonna we're gonna show that in a sec um, the uh, what was I gonna say so the film thickness varies by, by pressure okay so the more pressure that you're pushing through those um, the higher it raises um, and in this case it's if you crank this up a little bit uh, it's it's about a tenth it raises about a tenth and uh, but look at that look at that movement there it's just silky smooth and it has you know I'm pushing on it pretty good here it's got a good load capacity too so people think that air or you know that one opinion is that the air bearings can't carry any load and that's just not true and uh, we'll see that also in a second with this other one here all right so let me uh, let me uh, I'll bring the camera in a little closer I'll get this set up so that we can watch the liftoff um, when I uh, uh, add the air pressure uh, in fact let me uh, let me set this down okay so now it's down right and then they, they also have another style that uh, you can pull a vacuum on too and you can actually use them on uh, vertical surfaces which is kind of interesting too so all right okay so we're kind of set there so let me uh, let me zero this indicator and you know this is one of these white face ones so oops it's uh, actually you know it'd be better if I use an electronic get this thing to settle a little bit All right, so that's pretty good. Let me look in the viewfinder. And you know what? That's just a crappy angle there, Tom. How about this? Let's do this. I'll line that up with the, uh, with the camera axis a little bit, and then you guys can see the needle move a little bit. A little easier, hopefully. All right, that's pretty good. Not bad for a old geezer there. All right, so. All right, so I'm going to, i got to hold on to this. I'm going to put the air to it. Okay, the needle's moving just slightly. And I'm not quite fully free here. There I am, now I am. And I'm just, look at that, you can just glide, ooh, ooh, ooh. you can just glide around like a, like a air hockey puck, right? All right, so let me, uh, so we're, we're sitting at about a tenth right now. I'm going to take the air off and ground this out. Okay. Oh, I don't know, three quarters of a tenth or something like that. 75 millionths. Yeah, so I'm just going to call it a tenth. Uh, it's a little hard to Let's see if I lean on one side or the other. I'm, I'm pushing on the back now. I just want to see uh, it's pivoting a little bit, right? Because that uh, that puck's a little ways away, but it returns nicely. All right. Okay. So now let's look at the load carrying cap capabilities of these things, and I'll get that set up for you because it's really cool. All right. So this is the one I made here, um, and it's got a little tiny orifice here, and then a passageway from this barb that goes to this. And then um, the other important thing on these is the, uh, the length of the orifice is important. And I don't even know if I have it right, but it's uh, um, the, the diameter of that small hole is uh, 20 thousandths, it's about 500 microns. And then the, uh, the thickness of the, what's left of the, uh, or the length of that hole is about the same. It's about one to one ratio. So, uh, and I think you can get different behaviors um, um, out of the air bearing um, by lengthening and shortening that, uh, the, that orifice. Okay, and then this is, uh, I forgot what diameter, it's about three inches, okay? Just shy of three inches, you know, it's 75 millimeters in diameter. Got a nice clean surface plate. I'm gonna set that down, okay? Um, and plug some air into this thing, okay? 
And then uh, I'm going to stack some weight on here that you guys will get to see here. All right. So it doesn't particularly slide well right now. All right. And um, let's do this. We're going to put this hunk of brass on here. And I'm going to kind of make sure that I'm reasonably, yeah, it looks pretty good, reasonably centered. So this is uh, three and a quarter inches by uh, uh, seven and a half brass. I don't know, it's 20 pounds or something like that. And just for, for ha ha's, I'm going to add some more like that. Okay. And clearly, doesn't want to move, right? Now it does. <laughs> so look at that. Is that sexy or what? And you know, it just wants to take off, right? So that's riding on a film of air. And at, I don't know, what was that? What did they say? 30 or 40 PSI, something like that. I'll, I'll go check that in a minute. Now, can you imagine a, uh, a gigantic surface plate and little uh, bumper cars uh, with uh, these pucks underneath them. And, uh, and then you guys running around banging into each other. It'd be, uh, it'd be pretty fun. Anyway, so these have some load carrying capabilities. So uh, you want to make yourself a really cool uh, um, indicator stand for gliding around on the surface plate. This is one way you can do that. This is relatively simple to make. If you're going to make your own, in fact, let me, uh, let me unplug this here. Now you watch, the air will bleed out. I'm going to let it take off. Boom. And um, uh, let's get these off of here. That's probably worth 20 pounds. Um, if you're going to make your own, what I would suggest is um, that you hard anodize these just uh, so they don't get scratched. This is just... Uh, um, just bare aluminum 2024 it's a little harder than 6061 but if a little piece of grit gets under there and scratches this then they don't behave as well anymore and uh, so I would hard anodize this and um, probably poke poke the orifice in after the fact and um, and then you got a uh, you know when the thing grounds out or whatever you got a, a surface that's pretty durable so so there's air bearings uh, air bearings 101 just a quick just a, a glimpse of to some of the things that you can do with them and uh, to encourage you guys to try making one yourself and, uh, and uh, have some fun, all right? So there's a, there's a close-up view of the, of the two styles that uh, I showed you. These are the porous ones here. So there's jilly, millions of little holes in, the, in this surface that the air bleeds through to, to provide the cushion, where in this case here, uh, the air just comes out of that center hole. So these produce a different load carrying kind of capability. Um, and um, so the first one, so if this is a, um, if this is a flat surface here, this one with the orifice, um, actually let's, let's do it this way. So if that's the, if that's the puck, if that's the puck diameter here, okay, like that, the it, it kind of looks like this. It kind of looks like that. So the greatest load carrying and force is uh, kind of at the center and it tapers off. So consequently, these don't handle tilting very well. Well, these these little porous ones, the porous ones are superior, okay, this, you know, so if that's the diameter there, these kind of look like this. Okay, so they're more uniform over the uh, uh, over the diameter, right? So these handle tipping a little bit better, and uh, and you can scratch these, and um, you know they, they still perform. In fact, you can see some scratches in that one. Now there's some there's some schemes to improve this here. Uh, they cut you can cut some channels in like this, little shallow channels like this, and then you can bring out. Uh, little channels to feed those uh, to improve that and that that'll change uh, that'll oops bleh, that'll change <laughs> doesn't look like that <laughs> uh, it'll change that uh, load profile uh, a little bit um, just by cutting some little shallow grooves in there okay so uh, these are new ways you can look up on their website 
Um, and these are just commercial uh, ones that you can uh, make your own mountings for. Uh, they don't give them away, but uh, if you have an application uh, that you um, that can use them, uh, it's definitely worth looking at. So.